Cynthia Miller-Edris, you are a sociologist at American University where you run the polarization and extremism research and innovation lab. And in that function, you've been researching and following the extreme right for years. Um, you have also been warning about situations like the one we experienced last week, an insurrection uh, of, bio, of a violent mob at the U.S. Capitol, uh, which was fueled by nobody less than President Trump himself. Now, help us shed some light, please. What are we experiencing here? I mean, what we're experiencing here is millions of American people who now live in an alternative universe of facts. They have committed fully to a, a complete conspiracy theory and disinformation about the election, um, believing that the election is invalid, believing there's mass voter fraud, that uh, the traitors are actually the ones in uh, in in the you know in Congress and and who are supporting um, the the peaceful transition and so they believe they're now called upon and being mobilized to stop it so they think they're being heroic. Who are those people that we've seen going into the Capitol? This is one of the most interesting things because it's a real toxic mix and we've been seeing this over the past eight to ten months I would say is an increasingly diverse coalition forming across groups within the far right spectrum so we saw white supremacist and neo-nazi kinds of insignia there and tattoos and symbols uh, we also had the QAnon uh, conspiracy theorists there were proud boys there there were um, militia groups and then um, you know of course the wide large number of of kind of violently mobilizing um, Trump fans and MAGA supporters, and uh, which is a kind of a new mobilization for them, uh, moving out of the mainstream into a real extremist act. Is it really just white old men, that cliche that you have about Trump supporters, or are there women also, uh, younger people? Who are, who are they look, how are they looking like, the typical supporters? Yeah. They are um, overwhelmingly white. You still see that. What's interesting about this is that we are seeing more women. We saw that in the images coming out of the Capitol. There were, of course, a woman died um, in the protest. And, and we did see more women both outside and inside the Capitol expressing anger and participating in the violence. So that, that I think is attributable in part to the mobilization of Trump fans, but also because there are many more women involved in QAnon in general. And so the, the mobilization of QAnon to violent action would necessarily bring along more women who had been involved and gotten recruited into it, either because they believe they're actually stopping a child trafficking ring or because they've been drawn into it through kind of alternative wellness communities and other types of spaces that have been conducive to, uh, to, to QAnon growth. Well, there's a lot of aggression uh, among these uh, people and we've seen on social media in the last days that they were calling again uh, for protests, for violence ahead of uh, the inauguration day. What are you watching there? You know, I've just seen today the FBI issued a memo saying there are now armed protests planned in all 50 states sometime between the 17th and the 20th, as well as at the US Capitol. So obviously, you know, very concerned about the violence, um, the potential for violence coming from the far right, but also about the police response, which obviously was um, an utter failure last week on Wednesday, you know, we had a complete failure on January 6th, but at the same time, it's also disturbing to see what amounts to kind of a militarization um, of the city that I live in and of the necessary response to this uh, in order to ensure that any further insurrection is tamped down. So what, what do you think? What will we see happen? What's going to happen on Inauguration Day? I think we're going to see massive police presence. They've already uh, uh, already heard today that there are um, volunteer groups coming, you know, from the New York Police Department. That we have a variety of different agencies um, providing troops and providing officers. So I think we will see um, a, a massive law enforcement um, response. I think we'll have National Guard out and troops, and um, probably. Um, not the unarmed ones that we had on the 6th, but people who are really prepared to, uh, to step in and prevent uh, any further insurrection. So you believe there will be no violence on Inauguration Day? Unfortunately, I do not believe that. Um, I think it's, you know, but I, I don't expect another uh, overpowering of the police because I think they will come prepared. But I think there will be people coming into the city who are trying to uh, who are trying to 
uh, prepared to use violence. And so I think there will be a massive preparatory response. I've also heard today that the mayor has asked that there be no permits issued for gatherings. So, you know, there are many preventative steps being taken to not allow even protests to occur uh, in the kind of normal civil civil process um, that would prevent people from, from showing up and then potentially being swept up spontaneously into violence as well. Now, one quote I have seen a lot is uh, a Trump or war. And, you know, you, you, we all, we've all seen the video footage of the Capitol where people had Confederate flags on them. Uh, some appear to um, be open for uh, scenarios like a civil war. Now, where does this rhetoric really lead to? Do you believe in, in, in a scenario like a new civil war in the United States? I think that there are now a committed group of right wing extremists and a broader coalition forming across the far right spectrum that is openly advocating for civil war that sees this as a first step toward, um, you know, as an insurrectionary step sort of toward a revolution and that is framing what happened on the sixth as a tremendous success. So what we see in the chatter online is that um, for a small committed group of extremists, they see this as as one step towards civil war, and they believe that it can be mobilized to recruit and radicalize people further. Whether that happens, you know, I think depends a little bit in how the response right now um, is not just one of suppression of the existing extremist fringe, but also prevention and intervention that pays attention to the potential for more people to be mobilized into that fringe. Now let's let's try to take a look into the future. So President uh, Biden then uh, will be in uh, will will attend the inaugurate. He will be sworn into office on uh, January twentieth. Um, one of his big goals and challenges, of course, is to unite the nation. Right. So um, are we going to see in a half in half year from now on, say um, a, a successful president that will be able to unite? Uh, the nation to close that gap that was created among Americans, or is this perhaps the, the beginning of, of the rise of a new right-wing um, terrorism? I think that I don't envy President Biden the task ahead in terms of trying to unite the nation. I think that um, success will probably be measured in years rather than months uh, in that sense. And I think that um, what the best hope is at this point is to pull people back from the fringes, from having participated in this kind of violence and, and being willing to or support that kind of violence um, and come back into the mainstream, even on the mainstream right, but unwilling to use violence. Uh, what we want is for the extremists to be further um, pushed into the fringes and remain there. How can he do that? That, I wish I had a, a, a magic ball to tell you uh, what the solution is, because, you know, I think we have, uh, I mean, this is it, this is where I, I heard yesterday that there was talk of a reverse Marshall Plan. I mean, we need healing and it's true democratic resocialization, essentially, uh, you know, on the scale that this country hasn't really dealt with. And so actually, I think this is a question for, for German experts to, to help us with is what do you do? How do you resocialize millions of people who've come to believe in propaganda and disinformation um, that that about something that is just factually completely untrue. And so we first have to figure out a way to establish new trust to you know, bring these people back from the edge of, of this disinformation universe um, before we can even start to think about unity, I think. And then one, of course, one important aspect to the rise of extremism has always been social media, right? And um, if we look at the situation right now, uh, Facebook and Instagram have decided to ban Donald Trump. Twitter then followed suit. Um, then all eyes were on Parler that was taken off the app stores, was then also taken even offline. Um, so how dangerous um, is the remaining remaining app uh, Parler, um, the remaining app that basically is open for Donald Trump and for the extreme right? I think the, the issue of social media is that it obviously has proven to be tremendously dangerous when you have someone with a huge platform who's able to circulate, propagate, create disinformation, and do so from within a place of, of seeming legitimation. So when you have someone who is supposed to be the trusted source of information, or a trusted source of information, 
any elected official, um, including the president, but also state representatives, national representatives, who, you know, who Americans then come to believe that they're a source of legitimate information. Having a person like that share disinformation is incredibly dangerous. And I think we have now seen that. Whether, you know, deplatforming, certainly deplatforming helps cut that off. But again, I think it's more of a Band-Aid solution than actually, a, a, you know, solving of the problem, um, because certainly we'll still continue to have disinformation networks propagating uh, information online. But we're seeing QAnon be kicked off. We're seeing lots of, of, of individual accounts leave as well. So uh, it, can't, it can't hurt the situation at this point to have less disinformation circulating. How is the extreme right communicating now then if they're all being kicked off and including the president? I don't know how the president's communicating. I mean, I, I hear that he's, you know, trying to get a, into other Twitter accounts and share information, the POTUS account. I mean, you, you read these kinds of things online or, or in, uh, as, as journalists are reporting them. Um, but uh, uh, as far as the far right goes, there are a number of encrypted apps, you know, out there that they can still, that they still share information in on Telegram and others. Um, there are places, they, they will find spaces, online gaming communities and, and chat rooms. I mean, there's all kinds of servers where people can form networks and community, but those tend to be tighter, closed groups. They may be accessible or not, but, they, um, but they're not circulating kind of broadly to the public the way that Twitter is or that Facebook potentially is. And so um, it, it, it should help a little bit. It's just, I think, I think the evidence isn't there yet on, on, on whether it's too little, too late. Now, there have also been calls for targeting journalists and especially the media. Of course, there's always been a, a tense situation and atmosphere between the right and the media, but there are calls now targeting journalists, like really using military language on parlor, calling them soft targets. Um, uh, there was this one writing on a, on a Capitol door, murder the media. How much of a concern is that for you, really, those kind of threats? I think that's a tremendous concern. I think we've seen this also in Europe and Germany and elsewhere um, where there have been these sort of hit lists of journalists and real attacks with packages showing up at people's homes or um, uh, death threats. And uh, we've had that here before. We've had plots foiled, attacks on journalists and scholars, um, as well as tremendous harassment online in ways that can be really damaging and frightening. And so I think this is part of the threat to democracy as a threat and assault on the freedom of the press. Um, and it should be taken extraordinarily seriously. All right, so democracy under threat. Uh, what's your recommendation for the incoming President Joe Biden? I would like to see an investment on the scale of the 1 billion euros that Germany just dedicated to the 89 measures to prevent right-wing extremism. I mean, I think that's just a start, you know, but when you look at a country that had um, had a, a similar, not this large of a scale, but a similar kind of right-wing attack on parliament, building uh, four months ago and what the reaction was three months later to dedicate that much effort, the kinds of investigations happening, I mean, law enforcement and the military there. I mean, there are, there are lessons to be learned from overseas and how to take this more seriously and what can be done. We don't have to reinvent the wheel every time, um, but we certainly cannot do it without resources, without serious dedicated offices within the Department of Homeland Security and Justice and State Department that coordinate, collaborate, and, uh, and have real funds and resources dedicated to it. And right now we don't have essentially any of that. And so, um, you know, we can't start from scratch with uh, back of the envelope plans. It has to be a, a real set of initiatives that have weight behind them. Chilling insights. Thank you very much, Cynthia Miller-Idris of the American University. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Stay safe.